pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So I remind everyone that this meeting is being telecast and recorded on Channel 14. I also remind any member of the public who wishes to make an audio or video recording of the open session of this meeting to first notify me as chair, and I'll inform the public of the recording as is required by the open meeting law. Would you like to start us off with our... I would. I'd like to actually start with just a very short video from the Mullen Hall School. And I just thought this was wonderful, and I think it reminds us of why we do what we do. <laughs> it's going to show up behind you for everyone. I'm sorry there's not quite enough space tonight. How about that? Oh, no input. <laughs> it's really short. So it's you don't, need, don't feel like you need to relocate or anything. <laughs> Less than a minute. Yeah. <laughs> he heard that. He's going to come running down. No, he's already here. All right. There we go. Here we go. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Mrs. Batista challenged students in her class to write a phrase note, and Teddy has a phrase note he would like to share with you. Are you ready to read? Go, oh, Teddy. My mom, Kristen, my mom deserves praise because she loves me and keeps me safe. She is a good cook and works hard at the hair salon, and I love when she tucks me in and reads me a bedtime story. Your your fellow peace builder Teddy Lady. <laughs> 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 so adorable. <laughs> so cute. Hi, Christine. <laughs> oh, so sweet. Thank you for that. So adorable. I wish we could have one of those to start every meeting with. So we'll start off with public comment. Please limit comments to two minutes per individual on items that are not on tonight's meeting agenda. There's no debate or action taken on public comment items. The committee will take them under advisement and, or the individual may request it to be placed on a future agenda. The chair may allow public comment on tonight's agenda items when they occur during the meeting. Do we have any public comment tonight? Come on forward. You just ask you to sit at the, um, at the mic so that it will be picked, your voice will be picked up by the uh, recording. I have been informed that there was an item in the, uh, the Falmouth paper that there was some sort of uh, consideration being given to uh, change the Columbus Day designation to something to do with Native Americans. Sir, can you just tell us who you are so that we can make sure we get it in the record? I'm Darty, Neil Darty. Thank I you live, so much. I live here. In Falmouth, I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus Council 813. I was advised by some of my other brother members that this meeting was going to have a discussion about changing uh, or have something to do in the schools about not uh, celebrating Columbus Day and uh, instead uh, going toward uh, substituting Native Americans. Uh, concerns. I have nothing against the Native Americans. In fact, this morning I mailed a letter to an Indian school in South Dakota, but uh, the great admiral, and that's what he was, Christopher Columbus, should be honored in our view. And if uh, the school committee here wants to get politically correct and change the history a bit, we're going to fight it to the nth degree. That's all I can have to say. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Any other public comment tonight? We're t if you're, if you can hear me out in the hallway, <laughs> come on. In. Are you here for public comment? Uh, yeah, I heard about the. Uh... Please come on um, up and have a seat, so we can pick up your name and your comment for the record. All right. 
My name is Frank Howard. I live in a TK, TK, T, T ticket just down the road here. And I heard that we were discussing changing Columbus Day to Indigenous American Day. And I just don't think that's something we should do. I think there's a, definitely a debate that can happen. Um, however, uh, judging someone who lived in the 1400s by today's standards is incorrect. And I think a lot of the literature out there right now is, uh, is half that. Um, definitely a lot of things went um, not according to plan or uh, not according to what we would want to happen uh, back in the 1400s. However, a lot of the uh, documentation, especially online, um, is really taken from a 2006 set of documents that were found in uh, Italy, written by you know Christopher Columbus's uh, number one political rival for a governorship of uh, the new colony that he discovered. And to lay all the blame for a lot of the things that happened in this country on one person, I think is uh, not really correct. I mean, there's hundreds of years afterwards of different countries, different people, uh, different tribes um, committing atrocities against each other, and to kind of try to blame that on one person is just uh, historically inaccurate. That's all I have to say. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Any other public comment tonight? Come on forward. Okay, I'm Richard Castleberry the Grand Knight of Falmouth Council 813. And I have got this, gotten this information through the grapevine that it was going to be discussed at this meeting tonight. Uh, is that in fact true? It is not. It, I know it wasn't on the agenda because I saw the agenda this afternoon. Right. So you're not going to discuss it? We don't discuss it. anything that's not on the agenda. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Because w there's almost two million members around the world of the Knights of Columbus that will definitely fight changing the name of Christopher Columbus Day. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Richard McClone. And I'm here because there's been some nasty rumors that Christopher Columbus was a Civil War general from the South, and they want to tear down his statue. I'd like to inform you about Christopher Columbus, the man. Christopher Columbus was, um, it took him eight years in order to get his sailing together. He started sailing at 13, and um, finally Queen Isabella um, sold all her jewels so that he could um, get his three ships to uh, sail over. And he was the original dreamer. He actually uh, went 3,000 miles when most of the uh, people thought the world was flat. And he went to, um, he went, and uh, he, he uh, discovered most of the islands down in the Bahamas. Now, if um, some of the revisionist history um, impugns him as someone who mistreated natives and things like that, couldn't be further than that from the truth. Um, this is what he said. The admiral, which was him, force and compel all those who sail therein as well as all the others who go out here later on, that they treat the said Indians very well and lovingly and abstain from doing them any injury, arranging that, that both people hold much conversation and intimacy, each serving the others to the best of their ability. He also, he, um, he returned from a settlement in La Navidad on the island of Haiti, where he had left 40 of his men there when the Santa Maria was wrecked. His worst fears were realized when he got back to that island the Caribs, which were the dominant um, indigenous tribe in that area, were cannibals. And these cannibals went, attacked, and killed his 40 men and ate them all. And he was on a mission to try to save all the other islands because these Caribs would go to an island, they would kill off all the people one by one daily, eat them, 
go to the next island. They were actually decimating the islands down there, and Christopher Columbus fought these guys to protect the indigenous people from these uh, cannibals. And uh, they were also called piranha. So any of you that are familiar with that fish, that's because, and they actually took they, they went as far as raising people for food, and they, their favorite was boys around the age of 15 and, and fat female girls, according to the book. And so th this man was, uh, was not to be disparaged. He, uh, he was a great explorer. He put his life on the line, and his men paid for it too when, when, when they were killed and they died too. So um, I think uh, any, anything that you do about, you can have an indigenous people day, but to take and disparage this man who was one of the greatest explorers of the age is a big mistake, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? We can't have public comment from a school committee member. Sorry, Walter. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I, we, I and we're not going to comment on any discussion okay, that like has the, come like up. It's stance, not our policy. I like the stance they're taking. We're not going to discuss it. Okay. It is not protocol to have a discussion about public comment. All right. Uh, um, pending gonna, the end of. Are you going to vote on this? Uh, we haven't set an agenda item to talk about the calendar. But the calendar, the agendas are all posted online um, as soon as we set them. Okay. Will this be in the paper when? Uh, when you do this? I mean, will it be online that this will be coming up? For every agenda item, every agenda is posted on the school department, um, school committee website. So you can see everything that we're going to talk about. And we never talk about things that are not on the agenda. Is that, does that answer your question? Does that mean Christopher Columbus Day and the uh, possible changeover is not going to happen tonight? No, tonight we are not talking about the calendar and we are not talking about Christopher Columbus. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have our presentation of the Mass Certificate of Academic Excellence. Nancy, would you take so, this for us? Yes. I'd like Great. to speak to this. More things oh. to celebrate. We were just trying to find out how often you meet. Oh, the second and fourth. Two stages of the month. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. So the Certificate of Academic Excellence um, is awarded by my professional association, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents. I think this is really important. That's why I just wanted to wait a minute. And so when we look at the um, upcoming graduating class, I look at a couple of things. I look at a student's three-year cumulative average. I look at their rank in the class. I am allowed to personally select the student to receive this award. And I have some leeway when I look at the top 5% of the class. And the Falmouth Public Schools, because of our, the number of students we have, we are allowed one certificate. So Mr. Decker, Mr. Jonathan Decker, if you would have a seat up here, please, in the front. And if you don't mind, I'd like to speak to a couple of your accomplishments. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. Because I think it's really important to let people know some of your accomplishments. And there are so many pages, but I just want to highlight a couple, okay? So this young man got the, the Harvard Book Award. He was inducted into the National Honor Society. He was inducted into the tri -Am International Music Honor Society. He was inducted into the Math Honor Society. He, uh, Science Fair, he got the 300 Committee Prize for what is the most effective antacid to neutralize stomach acid. We need to talk about that. Like to <laughs> <laughs> you participated in ASLP at Mass Maritime. Stop me if I'm going on too much. <laughs> you are the uh, president as of September 2017 of the Falmouth High School Band. Correct. You are the cap captain of the varsity golf team. And I'm just highlighting a few. There are pages of this young man's accomplishments. Um, you are the vice president of the Falmouth High School Model UN Club, correct? Yeah. 
You are also, and this is very important to me, um, your volunteer and your community activities, and there are several of those, aside from your class rank and how well you've done in your AP courses. Um, you're an Eagle Scout, is that correct? Yeah. And that's September of 2017. You work, you volunteer in the Falmouth Town Band. You were a judge for the 2016 Science Fair for fifth and sixth graders. Music instructor for fourth grade instrumental instruction. So do a lot of volunteer work. And you also have jobs. So you are an incredible young man based on your academic achievement. And I have your report card right here. And I just want to say that um, I'm very honored for you to, be a, to receive the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Certificate of Academic Excellence. Thank you.
in, um, in Hyannis. And I would like to make a motion to have Terry Medeiros act as our delegate at the conference and to have uh, Melissa Keith act as our alternate. I'll second that. Any discussion about it? I just think it would be um, really nice to have Terry since she's already going to be presented to the MASC Leadership Award <laughs> at the conference. for you the first time we got this letter, but you weren't here, so yeah. we're doing it again. Um, it would be lovely to have you act as our delegate. It's yeah. the free food, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll take that. <laughs> Any other comments? Um, our delegates? All in favor of having, sorry, I have to do the whole thing, yeah. of having uh, Terry act as our delegate and Melissa act as our alternate? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, okay, so next on our agenda is the presentation of the secondary school improvement plans. Five through twelve. Who gets to go first? All so right. Start with Tim. Come on up. I have the longest drive, so, so they're gonna let you go first. We're not gonna let you leave, though. No. I'll give you my wife's number. You can discuss that with her in a little while. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, great. All right. So, um, goal one from Morse Pond this year is uh, the development of a STEM-based class that will encompass state digital literacy and science, technology, and engineering standards. This class will allow students to enter an environment of creative problem solving and experimentation, hands-on learning, and cutting-edge technology in the fields of science and math. Uh, simply put, we want to expose our, our kids to more science and technology standards, uh, more hands-on learning. We have an opportunity to do that next year in our, with our um, elective classes, with our, our specials classes. Um, our robotics enrichment class has been a massive hit over the last year and a half, and I think it's something we want to expose all of our students to. I feel badly that half the kids who want to take robotics are not able to, so we're going to work um, those types of hands-on projects into this class. I am already working with um, the curriculum director for both K through 6 and 7 through 12 as well as our technology director on what the standards would be that would be pertinent to this class. We're going to look at some other schools that have rolled out successful programs, look at um, what funding needs are, are, are needed to, to roll out the class successfully, and um, with the retirement of one of our teachers this year, we're going to look at who would be the ideal candidate to teach that class. Um, I think it'll be an exciting option. We have not added to or significantly changed any of the specials at Morse Pond in quite some time, so I think a new class along this avenue would be an exciting option for our kids. Goal number two, uh, Morse Pond will create a talented and motivated team model that provides engagement and differentiation for the school's highest achievers and provides a rich, engaging educational experience on grade level with their peers. Our team program has undergone uh, multiple facelifts over the last decade um, in terms of the number of students it's exposed to, what um, parts of the curriculum it focuses on, whether it engages kids on grade level appropriate curriculum or is an enrichment activity, um, things of that variety. And I think it, it's time that we, we do a little more research and a little more investigating and determine what is really a good model for our highest level learners because there's a lot of data that shows that we're really not engaging them very well and that they're not growing as much as their peers. And I think they deserve every opportunity to be challenged um, as the rest of the kids in their class. Um, so again, uh, Mr. Wadaker and I will be working very closely with um, uh, Dr. Kerry Whipple, my assistant principal this year, to um, examine models that have worked statewide to familiarize ourselves with um, uh, research on talented and motivated education and within the frameworks of what our, our school currently offers decide what is the best opportunity for our kids. Um, I'm hoping to be able to in the spring make a presentation to the superintendent on what we've decided is the optimal model for Morse Pond kids and to be able to um, showcase it to incoming parents in the spring. And goal number three is to target chronically absent students and determine appropriate interventions to raise attendance. Currently, 11.1% of Morse Pond <laughs> students are considered chronically absent, uh, which is chronically absent is missing more than 10% of the school year. 
Um, and this is a, a sticky, this is something that's going to be an ongoing goal, I think, for Morse Pond, and, and, and I'm happy to continue to tackle it. We want to make sure that, that the opportunities we offer our kids are engaging and keep them in school, that kids at that age, for whatever reason that's causing them to miss 18 or more days of the school year, that we're addressing that appropriately with their parents and or state agencies. Um, I'm going to continue to work with the district on, on the redrafting of our attendance plan for the district, which I'm hoping we'll be able to talk more about as the fall goes on, and will allow us to really to begin to, um, as a district, address um, student attendance. So it will be an ongoing concern for our school. Our guidance counselor has uh, made it her goal this year to tackle attendance head on, um, and the bulk of her work will be focused around that area. Hey, sorry, I was ready. Uh, any questions? No, Mr. McLaughlin. Walter. Um, good presentation. Thank you. Um, have, have you uh, been able to implement the absentee issues that you had at your seminar? Correct. So we're still working on that. It, it's gone back and forth with our, our legal team and the, the uh, policy subcommittee of the school committee is working on it. Um, so I'm hoping in the near future it's something that we can speak about in a more public forum. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that in short order it'll be. I think that would make a big difference. I agree. Once you can do that. I agree. Yeah. Other comments? Leah. Um, for the STEM uh, class, yes. would that be offered to all fifth and sixth grade? It would, be, it would take the place of our current computer class. Okay. Um, and it would be offered once per six day cycle for all students at Morse Pond School. And we understand that, you know, that by changing the computer class, there would still be standards that are in the computer class that we rolled into this new class. So we would not be eliminating the computer class. We'd be kind of tightening up what we offer during that time. I'm going to tag on to that since we're on that subject. So I'm wondering if there's any thought about partnering with some of our science. I mean, we're in, like, science central. No, <laughs> so, no question. Um, whether or not there's any whether that's on the radar. Yeah, we're not at that point yet. Um, right. I have had meetings with um, Deb Kloom, the president of the St uh, Falmouth STEM Boosters. Um, I have multiple parents who are scientists at Woods Hole, and it's been a constant topic of conversation since the spring. Right. There will be involvement with the Woods Hole and uh, MBL community. I'm just not sure at this point yet what that will look like. Any other questions? Yeah, Andrew. Um, on your goal number two, um, mm -hmm. I really like the sound of it. I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm reading it right. It sounds like when you're looking f um, at what to do and make changes for talented, motivated, um, and the team approach, that it's looking more to differentiate the learning Correct. versus having it something where it's seen as you get to go do something fun where we don't, right? The, so. the distinction between an enrichment class where all students can and should take that or have that offering um, to something that is tailored to the specific educational needs of that child and might not be appropriate for other children based on their needs. That's Correct. That's great. I think yeah. that would be a, a nice addition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John. Just to comment, Tim, you're doing a great job. And, Thank you. Um, you're welcome. And just to see last year being on site as in, in a, in, when I was on site over there in a capacity to, uh, to observe your team and yourself doing a great job with having the you know the Morse ticket dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, and now this year being a parent of a child over there and seeing that you know your team and yourself uh, doing well as okay now we're back to just being more smart. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And it's great. So kudos. Thank you. Leah, um, sorry, I just wanted to add on to the the team aspect and that I'm I really appreciate that you're diving into this and going to do some research and see mm -hmm. what talented and motivated programs look like around. Mm -hmm. Um, and just the, the fact of really doing more of an accelerated type of program for students that would be still looking at the standards mm -hmm. and instead of students being taken from their core classes, um, getting those core mm -hmm. classes, but accelerated. You're still exposing the kids to the great appropriate standards, but at a level that meets their needs rather than what the rest of the group may be doing. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Okay. Thanks for coming, and I love your mm -hmm. goals. I specifically want to speak to goal number three mm -hmm. with the um, interventions to raise attention <coughs> to uh, attendance. Uh, I think it's great that you, this is part of your one, and one through three goals. I think that it's extremely important that attendance is really, uh, it's unfortunate that it slips because I don't feel like we see that big of a number in the elementary school, and I'm. Correct. I'm concerned that that 
seems to be mm -hmm. um, not the standard or the norm, but I, I it's, it's very concerning, 18 plus days a mm -hmm. year. So um, thank you for making it one of your goals. And I'm interested to hear um, more about it as the year goes on. I agree, thank you. Anything else? Can I just call it one thing? And that's the alignment with um, the curriculum office and that you're looking vertically. And I think it's really important that you're working with um, Zach, but also working with Sonia to make Correct. sure mm. that what kids are getting at Morse Pond, those skills, are then transferable to Lawrence. I, That's I, a very big deal. I want to make sure I don't write a check that Mr. Bushy can't cash. You know, <laughs> no question. You'll hear about it. <laughs> oh, I sure will. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming and sharing Thank with you. us. Thank you. Have a good night. Hope we got you out of here fast enough. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bushy, you're up. Okay, tough act to follow there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Tom Bushy. I'm the principal of the Lawrence School, and I have two kids at Mr. McLaughlin's school, so I'll also be keeping an eye on how things are going. <laughs> two more coming. <laughs> at some point. So uh, thanks for having us. Um, I just want to say before I get into the goals that of the, all three of our goals are really designed uh, with uh, an intention of keeping an eye on attendance, and uh, we think that the things we're going to do this year will uh, decrease chronic absenteeism. But uh, I work specifically with attendance with uh, my uh, one of my goals for the superintendent. Okay, so goal number one, in an effort to create the most positive learning environment possible for all students, particularly students who have adverse childhood experiences, we work to increase our supports and interventions around mental health and wellness throughout the school year. I know you have the action steps, so I just want to point out a couple of, call attention to a couple of them. That's a pretty far-reaching goal. Uh, and if you see in the action steps, we are going to be focusing on some movement opportunities for the kids, uh, particularly exploring options around a scheduled recess and movement break. Right now it's pretty informal. I like to formalize that a bit. And uh, also, as far as the mental health, I would like to call attention to our increased Gosnold school-based counselor from two to three days per week. Uh, our counselor now is very busy, and uh, we're pleased with the fact that we've been able to provide that for uh, an additional day. Um, Goal number two. Is that right? Uh, this is a uh, goal number two is uh, to encourage and sustain a positive behavioral support system. Lawrence School will develop a school wide positive behavior framework. This process provides a visual aid to better illustrate the levels of misconduct and the correlating disciplinary actions associated with the infractions. The expected positive behaviors are clear and posted throughout the school, and positive incentives will be implemented throughout the school year. Uh, the pause joke fell flat at Meet Your Teacher Night. <laughs> uh, you guys can see, though, we're talking about where the bulldogs, right? So the pause of behavior, get it? Uh, the best jokes are the ones you have to explain. I think so, perhaps. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with that. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, uh, I want to call out the uh, summer professional development that we we're thankful to uh, be uh, thankful to get support from the curriculum office for. Uh, we, we gathered the team leaders and our administrative team to get together and talk about some behavioral uh, con concerns and ways we thought we could make improvements. And it was really great to see uh, a group of staff members there uh, really digging into the work and focusing on um, uh, how we can provide better supports for students and again uh, going back to uh, our adverse childhood experience scenarios. So the positive behaviors are clearly, uh, the expected behaviors are clearly posted throughout the school and uh, it, this has been helpful in as much as uh, you know if I'm in the cafeteria and someone is running towards the lunch line for me to simply stop and say look Here's the positive behavior. It's right there. It's clear. The kids can read. Okay, I'm supposed to walk in the cafeteria. I get it. Because we assume sometimes that the kids uh, know that you're supposed to walk in the cafeteria. But it's a good reminder for them to see and for us to review it with them. And uh, another um, action step here, and one that's already been, uh, I've already been pleased to see, is an increased commitment from classroom teachers to communicate with families. Uh, one of the steps here in, uh, in, in organizing and uh, streamlining, if you will, uh, our current code of conduct uh, has been a, uh, a revisiting of, you know, when, when we're talking about behavioral concerns with students, uh, the teachers uh, are expected to communicate with the parents and uh, as we know for people who communicate with parents and being parents ourselves, it's uh, almost always a conversation that ends positively when you are on the same page with a, a staff member and a parent. 
Also, if you're around the school, you'll see a, an inclusion of the word compassion into our school motto of pride, respect, responsibility. And the compassion piece is one we're going to build on over the course of the year uh, because uh, we know that compassion is, uh, some, is something that we should practice in our everyday life and school. And the things that are on the opposite side of compassion are things that we want to address and uh, steer clear of. Goal number three. Uh, this is an extension of last year's goal. <clears throat> To foster a sense of community support and encouragement throughout the school year, we're piloting an advisory program. This scheduled time for positive peer and student adult interaction will create a supportive and comfortable environment for all students, as well as develop self-worth, confidence, and respect for others, and encourage a school-wide connection for all members of the community. Uh, last year, when I met with this group, um, I had indicated that uh, we were not we were not quite ready to implement an advisory program. Since that meeting, uh, again, thanks to uh, central office, we were able to uh, provide some, uh, some professional development this summer. And I had a number of staff members in the summer working with myself to really uh, just push advisory forward. And we've implemented it on day one this school year. And I'm very, very happy to see that it's, uh, it's been a positive experience so far. And a couple of the action steps um, you will see is uh, just myself overseeing daily advisory meetings uh, with individual groups to monitor the progress and it takes me probably three days to get into all the advisory groups. I can really you know, go through the uh, hallways quickly just to say hello, but just a, a brief visit with these advisory groups who are meeting 12 minutes a day in the morning, first thing in the morning is really inspiring to see the way that they're uh, developing a connection with that advisory teacher and it's just a really great way for the kids to start the day. Another uh, action step is if I lump three of them together, it's about the built-in school time that we have to address school-wide issues that come up over the course of the year. Um, in, instead of getting everyone out of class to go to assembly to talk about appropriate use of social media, now we can filter that out through advisory time that's built there. Uh, obviously, to invite community partners into the building and uh, to hold uh, school-wide community building and school spirit events and activities. It's all happening right now, uh, and it's very exciting. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to visit, just let me know. Um, I would, before taking any questions, just like to call out the work of Janice Lewis and Danielle Velesic, who have uh, done an incredible job helping us uh, implement that advisory for goal number three. So uh, any questions anyone has about those goals, I'd be happy to try my best to answer. And any questions for Mr. Bushy? Leah. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the summer PD was? So how do you, how do you get ready for advisory? How does so, that work? so uh, going back to, to last year, uh, when we were in the process of going through last year's action steps to implement an advisory, we intended to start something before the school year ended last year. Uh, we visited mm -hmm. another school. Uh, we reached out to uh, multiple area schools that were doing an advisory to see how things were doing. We, we, uh, we know that uh, what's right for other communities isn't always right for Falmouth and vice versa, so we really wanted to find something that was going to be best for us. And we went at it one way to, uh, uh, let me try and speed this up, we went at it one way, we learned some things, we changed things to make it best for our staff. And then with the information that we had going into the summer, professional development work, um, we were able to, uh, and again, Danielle and Janice, uh, Robin Bowerman, some other folks, uh, really put together a very, very clean and concise uh, way for people to come back to the school building and alleviate their concerns, whether it was going to be an additional prep, um, whether they were going to have to develop a curriculum. I would say they overplanned. Uh, one of the things they did was set up a website and a calendar to see every day you could come in and open up, you know, what are we doing on September, you know, 8th or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you see, we're going to do, we're going to be talking about, you know, respect for your learning community today. What does that look like? Conversation with the kids. Mm -hmm. Some people follow it step by step. Uh, some people are very comfortable with sitting down and having a conversation with kids and just you know building that rapport on their own, mm -hmm. but it's over planned, uh, and obviously the goal is for people to seamlessly go through the year, find this to be effective and uh, and positive for the kids and for the adults, and then uh, make it something that we can build into the culture for next year. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, um, my question is where where does the curriculum come from? So if you're they developed it. They developed they it. They developed it. I mean, I'm sure that there are some things that uh, you know they didn't reinvent the wheel. I mean, there's some right. days where they might be doing a minute to win it activity. Of course, those are out there for anyone to find online. 
Uh, but as far as uh, as far as the monthly themes, if you will, mm -hmm. that stuff is specific to Lawrence. I mean, our first our first few months are pride, respect, responsibility, and then we're going to get it to compassion, like I mentioned for the second goal. Yeah. Okay. Great. Tom, did you um, think about some of the issues that you had last year and ways to address them through the advisory? Because that's uh, yes. what it felt like. Yes. Mm -hmm. They identified issues. <clears throat> staff identified some issues and wanted to come up with ways to work with those issues and work through them by building stronger relationships with kids uh -huh. and having certain conversations and making sure that those conversations were threaded throughout every advisory period. Yeah, you said it you said it perfectly and uh, and in you know in some in some cases we will have to filter that out. So we've got a concern with kids doing this or kids not doing this. Here's a message that we'd like the entire student body to get. And uh, we can we can go through that process. We can take a week, two weeks, whatever whatever time we want on it. Yeah, I, I, it sounds wonderful. And mm -hmm. um, having a daughter experience it now is thank great you to say. Um, and I love the idea that there's smaller groups to mm -hmm. handle these issues too. So it's not like you're having a whole assembly. It's like individually in their small groups they can mm -hmm. really talk about these issues. Even so. though the time is short, I think it's much more meaningful. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a comment and a question first. I think it's great, and I got the positive. Thank you. Because I remember the hold up. It's great that you're putting a positive um, thought in their head rather than don't, you know, throw your stuff on the ground. Instead, you say, you know, look at it the positive way. I think that's Do throw it in the trash barrel. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I'm sure you have more do's than don'ts. A, pers a, a positive person does this yep. instead of don't do that. I think that's great. Um, and th I wondered about the bullet that talks about um, positive incentives that the teens do because I um, haven't taught high school. Even high school kids love to get little mm -hmm. thingies. And you're never too old, so do yep. you? Yep, no, absolutely. And then, you know, we learned from, uh, uh, from the McLean uh, presentation on opening day, you need to attend to the behavior you want to see, right? So when you see a kid throwing their trash in the trash, and that's not a great example, right? But you say, nice job. Okay, so we have, we have some positive tickets that we're hoping to implement. That hasn't started yet, but we did already have some team-wide uh, celebrations, and I think we do a really great job of celebrating academic excellence, uh, but we're trying to celebrate some positive behavior. So uh, a couple teams have already had their team-wide, um, I don't know what you want to call it, they've had a team-wide gathering for kids who have gone through the first, uh, first five weeks without uh, having any infractions and uh, the students that have had hiccups they have a separate conversation about you know here's how we're going to get to that here's how we're going to get to that so we're all at this celebration if you will thank you mm -hmm. Andrew. Um, it sounds like the advisory program is really resonating with a lot of us so um, I think that uh, you know the, the small groups that Leo was talking mm -hmm. about just how um, the kids are going to be able to connect better there and um, are, are listening more intently than something that might be happening in a large setting. I know it's early in, but have you had any feedback yet from students or your staff on how it's going? Staff, yes. I've got a lot of feedback from staff saying that they really enjoy that time of day. It's a good way to start the day. Uh, I, I have uh, in plan, a plan to really get some serious data that I can, you know, see if this is something that's, that's, that's working really great, then let's find out exactly why it's working great uh, and then present it to the staff for when it comes time to decide how we go forward with this. Uh, because, it, you know, it was a change. They each lost a minute a day from their instructional time, which, you know, we say a minute a day, but once you start chipping away that time for teaching and learning, uh, we know that our teachers really want to use every minute. So uh, we will... Uh, be putting together some stuff to some uh, ways to gather information about specifically why it's working. Exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate that. Yes. I wanted to speak on two goals, if that's okay. First, your goal two. You mentioned the word compassion. I just think that teaching and showing mm -hmm. compassion is at this impressionable age is really important, and. I think that it's hard to be a junior high school, it's hard to be pre-teen, early teen, and the more compassion that we show, hopefully we can kind of turn the tide of humanity maybe just a little bit. Um, so I really appreciate 
you using that word and Thank really you. being thoughtful with that with these very impressionable children. Thank you. For uh, goal three, um, I think that the 12 minutes a day is a great way to start the day. I, I understand that you know you said that um, it's a minute out of the day for the teachers, and it's um, you know you start chipping away. But I, I think that it's it's great to kind of have that conversation in the beginning and not having to wait for a big assembly for just a quick mm -hmm. low down. Let's you know start the day right. So again, yep. great job. Thank you. And if I may, just the, you know. We know that sometimes these goals overlap, right? You'll see one of the bullets here is an increased opportunity for students to take advantage of the grab-and-go breakfast. And we know that for uh, you know for students' wellness, if their bellies are full, they're going to have a better experience in school. So uh, this this 12 minutes is a lot more inviting for kids to go down and get breakfast and sit and eat an advisory than they would to sit for four minutes of announcements and then right on to history class or whatever. So. Little... That was actually my last comment. It was about how, it, you know, it probably wouldn't work in Excel because I think it's like a circular logic, but the, the goal one, you could put the advisory program right under it mm -hmm. because it's going to contribute to the, to the wellness of kids, especially kids with adverse childhood experiences, to be able to start their day calmly, yep. quietly, with a person that matters to them and have food. <laughs> you know, there's no way that that's not going to help their wellness. So. Um, I think it's really cool how they're connected. Thank you. Any last, John, sorry. Uh, just a comment, operational uh, and uh, facilities comment. So I know you have the, the new uh, uh, boiler up and running over there and you've got the new windows. So it'll actually be kind of a neat thing to track uh, yeah. what the efficiencies are of that versus prior year's uh, costs for fuel. Oh, and yeah. yeah. So it'll be kind of a cool thing to see with those two things combined, we might have some savings that, that we could share back with the town. And the, pl and the school play will not be frozen. Okay. I remember your comment a couple of years ago. Like that. <laughs> Absolutely, I'll make a note of that. Any last great, comments? Great job, Thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming and sharing your goals with us. Look forward to hearing My about pleasure. it at the end of the year. Good scans. I almost said good morning, good evening. <laughs> Mary Gans, uh, Falmouth High School principal. And um, my goals, as you can see, are our goals. The first one is while we're continuing with our weekly coordination medical review team meetings, we also are piloting and incorporating into those meetings what we're calling a bridge program, which is modeled after the uh, Bright program, which is in many schools across Massachusetts. Uh, started about 12, 13 years ago at Brookline High School. And what it is, it's a transition program for students who are returning to school from um, an extended absence, whether it was a hospitalization or any kind of absence, typically focused on students with mental health needs. Um, as you know, Falmouth High School experienced over the past couple of years a significant increase in students um, going out for hospitalizations, and we had uh, very high increase over the past two years of home hospital tutoring requests. And one of the um, positive aspects of a bridge program is we have staff in the school. We're using uh, Rory Morris, who's our special education connect teacher, and Katie Fouth, who is our uh, connect adjustment counselor, to staff the bridge program. So it's a hybrid program. It's connect slash bridge. And, um, the key to the program is, is we get students, if they are out for some reason, and they qualify for criteria in entering the bridge program, we get them in the school, they receive their academic support, and there's a real specific student, individual student plan to transition them back to their regular schedule um, as quickly and as smoothly as possible. This summer, I, I give a huge shout out to Tom McManaman, who's here tonight, and Katie and Rory. They worked this summer very diligently to put together program materials that were very, very clear, not only for students and families, but for other staff in the building as well to understand what the bridge program is, the student population it's designed to meet. Um, and so far, it's, it's been very good. We have a prioritization document that we use to decide whether someone uh, a student does fit the profile of entering the bridge program. It's a temporary, you know, ideally it's a temporary um, placement for a student. <clears throat> and I was just speaking to Alan Kazarian today looking over some data and at this time last year we already had 13 home hospital tutoring requests. This year we've had zero so far. 
and the students in our bridge program have been very, very successful. We've even had um, some of their parents say, the program is just a lifesaver. My child is coming to school, has a safe place, is getting back into their regular classrooms. Um, it's, it's really a, a fabulous program. We'll pilot it this year. We're working closely with um, their people from the Bright organization who consult with us and work closely with us. And actually, we just met with them Friday, and they're a great support because they've been doing this for several years, and they have great insight on what works and what doesn't work, and they always have really practical answers to our questions. Um, so they've been a great support as well. Whoops. How do I do this? Uh-oh. I just went all the way back to the beginning. Okay. Oh, then I went to the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can go now. <laughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> what did I hit? Just return. I, oh, I thought I hit. Oh, are you on too? Yes, I'm on goal too. Thank you. So the second goal that we have at the high school is to continue to ply, pilot Clipper Time. Um, it ha was uh, successful in its first year. At the end of the year last year, the <coughs> faculty took a anon an anonymous confidential vote, um, I guess it's not confidential if I'm talking about it now, but <laughs> an anonymous vote um, as to whether they want to continue with Clipper Time this year and continuing um, monitoring it and seeing how it goes and 100% of the faculty at that faculty meeting said yes, they would like to continue with it. We, one of the uh, aspects that we're trying to expand this year is how to increase the mentor-mentee relationship on Mentor Mondays, similar actually to what Tom Bushy was talking about with his advisory. Uh, we already have some teachers who are doing things, but one of the, one of the um, I don't want to say drawbacks, but one of the, some of the feedback we received last year was uh, in response to a question, do the mentors feel like they're developing relationships with their mentees on Mentor Monday? And some said yes and some said no. Many said, we're so busy scheduling, scheduling them for the rest of the week that we're not really um, having time for conversation. So we're looking at that and how to expand that. And uh, we're going to collect data this year on um, homework stress, student discipline, grades to see if Clipper Time is having a positive impact in that regard. Overall, it, we receive positive feedback from teachers, students, and parents about it. Um, so, so far, so good, and we're just gonna keep plowing ahead with that. Goal three is, and um, Sonia and I will be doing an MCAS presentation shortly, we are going to continue our efforts to improve our MCAS scores and narrow achievement gaps with a specific fo focus on those subgroups, students with uh, disabilities, economically disadvantaged students, and high need students. Um, this year, we, uh, were, I won't say, yeah, I will say disappointed. I was hoping that we would have um, some better MCAS scores and we definitely have some gaps that we need to really dig deep and look at and improve on moving forward, so that will be a real focus for us. Yes, sorry, I'm, I, I get lost in my own thought. <laughs> <laughs> Leah. Um, so I, I definitely was thinking about Clipper Time with the advisory piece and um, thinking that there are some similarities, um, though my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that students use this clipper time in, in any way that they feel like they need support? Is that? Not necessarily. Okay. So clipper time on Monday, they meet in a small group with a mentor who's an adult in the building who otherwise wouldn't typically have a relationship with that group of students. And the mentor pulls up the student's schedule for clipper time and can see, oh, guess what? Your chemistry teacher already scheduled you for Tuesday and Clipper Time, your English teacher scheduled you for Wednesday, your math teacher scheduled you for Thursday. Teachers can pre-schedule students if they feel they've reached a certain level, they think they need some help. But if a student has an open schedule, that means that teachers haven't pre-scheduled them and the mentor talks to the student, okay, you're not scheduled yet, where do you think you would like to go, um, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And this reaches every single student from, um, uh, the AP kids who are taking three or four AP classes to um, everybody in between and you know because 
a student who's taking three AP classes, even if they're not pre-scheduled, they could say, I have an AP test on Thursday and AP stats. I want to be on Wednesday with my AP stats teacher. We've also had teachers use it as, um, I always use this example, we had an English, a freshman English teacher who saw that 19 of her freshman students were not grasping her citation lessons. Rather than relying on hit or miss after school and saying, you know, you kids have to come on my stay day, she actually booked those 19 students for clipper time and gave them an intensive lesson on citation. Mm -hmm. um, we had our AP statistics teacher. She opened up clipper time one day. She said she didn't pre-schedule the students, but she said, we're having a test Tuesday afternoon. If you want to come during clipper time on Tuesday, we will do test review. She had all of the students sign up that day, and they had an opportunity for 33 minutes to ask questions and then two hours later take the test. Okay, so the teachers need to let the mentor, or somehow the mentor knows on Monday that those those things are open? Yes, they can, you can see it. We have you a scheduling program. Okay. It's flexible uh, scheduling software called yeah. Enriching Students. They open up that and they can see, you know, Mary Gann shows up and it shows either I'm open on Tuesday through Friday or I'm open Tuesday and I'm booked Wednesday through Friday. Okay. Um, so they can talk to the student about you're already booked or we have some choices here. Okay, but the scheduling does happen on Monday yes. for the whole week. Yeah. Um, I, another question I had, just because I was thinking of mentors kind of like advisor, mm -hmm. right? Um, in this, But then I was also thinking about the mentor-mentee relationships that are separate, like the VIPs yes, mentor right. mentee. And I was wondering, is that also a time that those visits could take place? Or? During Clipper time? Yeah. Yes, we've actually, we've talked about opening up um, to, it, the first year it was solely academic. Mm -hmm. um, although, for example, I was able to, when I wanted to address an entire class for um, certain issues that we had to talk about, I booked every senior to the auditorium during Clipper time one day so that we had a good 33 minute period where we could have a nice conversation about a variety of issues that had come to my attention. Um, this year we're talking about expanding Clipper time to even have VIPS mentors come in or student mentors. Mm -hmm. So we've already identified um, some freshmen that we think are struggling. We know we've got some upperclassmen who started out struggling but are now really successful. We're talking about pairing them up during um, Clipper time for you know a mentor, a student mentor session. Adjustment counselors get to take groups together during mentor uh, Clipper time and then they're not pulling them from an academic class uh, in order to get a group together. Uh, guidance counselors use it to do scholarship workshops, college application workshops. It's um, it's really for a variety of purposes. Amazing. That's awesome. Any other questions? I just have a comment. Uh, I'm a really big fan of Clipper Time. I, you know, my my own uh, children have taken advantage of it. But I literally just a few hours ago came from a discussion at a soccer game. Uh, where four different families were talking about how positive Clipper time is. And the really cool thing, Mary, is a young man that was one of the brothers of one of the boys playing described Clipper time as well as you just did, which I think <laughs> Excellent. Is so the, the students get it, the, yeah. the, the teachers get it, and then we'll teach the parents to get it. I'm slowly getting it. Right. <laughs> but the more, most important thing is that you guys get it, so thank you. Well, one of the interesting things is we decided we didn't want to start Clipper time on day one. We just, for some reason, thought, you know, we don't even know where students might need help at that point or support. So we waited, what, three weeks was it, Tom? And um, boy, we had complaints from teachers and students. You know, we really just should have started right away because it ju we just should have. We knew in the first week that we had work to do, and so we should have just started right away. So, Walter. Um, great concept, the clipper time. Uh, out of curiosity, is that during the school day or after it's school? It's during the school day. So oh, it's it from 1012 to 1045 every day. <laughs> oh, so you leave a space for yep. it? Okay. Andrew. Um, that was a great segue, Walter. Um, and mine's not so much a question, maybe an observation that I'm sure you've already probably um, observed as well. And you know, we hear about the um, these these different programs that are pulling away from some of the instructional time, but we're really seeing positive benefits that are making the time that they do have more productive. And so it's the, the quality versus the quantity. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many different areas that we can be looking at to improve 
even if it is pulling a little bit away from instructional time because it's going to make such a bigger impact down the road. Right. So I think that's great that, um, that people are willing to do that mm -hmm. because you can try it with small amounts and then you can see where you might be able to expand that into other areas. Right. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions for Mary? I just have one comment. Yeah. And one of the pieces that I'm really impressed by with Clipper Time is that it is individually tailored to every single kid at Falmouth High School. That is no easy feat. And so I think that's really, really important, whether it's to enrich, support, study for a test, meet with a mentor. And that's a really difficult thing to do. And they've been able to do it really well. Um, the only other thing I had is I'm super excited about the bridge program. I think that it has incredible potential. Um, so the only thing I jotted down was how are families finding out about it? Because I'm just thinking that families who have kids who have been hospitalized, you know, that's all new to them too. They don't know how to navigate any of that. So right. how will they know that so this exists? We had some students whom we knew from the spring were had, had been hospitalized, were struggling with coming back to school. So we had meetings with those families um, at the end of the summer even to talk about are they potential candidates for the bridge program. We have our weekly coordination meetings where we have we discuss students that we know are in need of certain supports and what we do is we reach out to the families we bring them in for a meeting um, we recently had a student come back we had the student and the guardian come in we had a meeting about this is what we have available for the bridge program we first as a school team though we prioritize our students needs and decide the highest need gets the first slot in the bridge program we can't have mm -hmm. you know 45 students in there we have to we be very careful about um, how many students and not overloading um, not only the program but the staff and and their needs and their need their ability to actually work with the students so we have um, actually Tom and Rory and Katie created information to give to parents so we discuss it with them, we explain what it is, it's a support system, it gets your child in school rather than tutoring you know, outside of school, which the longer they stay away from the school, the harder it is to get them back in. So we just have very open communication with the families. Awesome. Yeah. Is it possible for us to get that document that explains the bridge program? Yes. Yep. Okay, Absolutely. that would be great. Yeah, because you know, we like to be able to communicate about I would like to be able to explain it to people. Absolutely. Accurately. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Any last questions? Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming. Thank you. Can't Thank wait you. to hear about it at the end of the year. Thank you. I know. Um, is there any public comment on any of the school improvement plans? Actually, I'm to ask. Okay. Well, you were out of the chair for all of 30 seconds, and then you get to go right back to it. So um, our grade 10 MCAS presentation. Yes, hello, Thanks. Mary Gibbs. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Sonia and I are here obviously to talk about the grade 10 MCAS results. Also, with us are Tom McManaman, who is uh, an incredible assistant principal at the high school, um, Carrie Fitzpatrick, who is our 7 through 12 math department head, Sarah Cox, who is our 7 through 12 English department head, um, Steve Edwards is also here, he's one of our department heads, and Pat DiPillo is our French department head. Um, we at I mean, foreign language, foreign language. I don't know why I thought French. Um, through Sonia's leadership, we actually started an MCAS working group to really look at the MCAS data, and that's what Tom, um, Carrie, Sarah, and I are on that group, as well as Chris Brothers. Um, and we just really have dug into this data and are here to present it for you tonight. Um, also, uh, Terry Nelson, who is oh, yeah, at Falmouth High School, and uh, Charlie uh, Jodwin have spent some time um, helping us flesh through this response. So, um, as Mary said, we are supported by uh, several of our colleagues um, who have helped us through this process, but also as we get started, we have to just take a minute to applaud all of the teachers in their, their, their continuous effort and dedication to all students 
and the role that they play in this response effort as well, uh, although we could not fit all of them at the table in our discussions. Um, just to sort of start out and provide some context to the work, um, we sat down at the table and really fleshed out what is our cycle? How are we responsive to the data? So we start off with the data review, as Mary alluded to. We spent a lot of time um, doing that this fall. And then we plan an instructional response, and we use our common assessments to gauge whether or not our response is uh, successful or not, and if we have to redirect. Um, I think in walking through what that process looks like, it took us to a point where we actually wanted to take um, a historical perspective. We realized that we're being responsive in many cases to the snapshots that are presented to us in the spring. And so what we wanted to be able to do as part of this process is also take a 10-year retrospective. So there's some longitudinal trends, some of which point to um, really great successes that we've experienced. And there are a couple that point to persisting challenges. And we're at the conclusion of this, we're going to talk about the action plan for responding to those in particular. <laughs> So this uh, graph, which Sonia put together, and I'm not exactly her sh how, sure how Sonia puts these graphs together, but this is a, uh, from 2007 forward, uh, grade 10 ELA MCAS scores over time for the aggregate of our students as compared to the state. The red is the state. So you can see, um, even over the past five years even, 95, 98, 96, 98, 98, we have consistently been quite high. Um, and we are all, always above the state average there as well. So each of those numbers is the combined percentage of students earning proficient and advanced in particular. So this is looking at the aggregate for English language arts. So 98% held for the past two years is a pretty magnificent feat. Um, blue is the Falmouth High School trend line. So following that trend line and making the comparison for mathematics, you can see again, we're at a two year point holding at 90. 90 is the highest level of achievement that our aggregate has had. However, one of the things um, that we kept bringing back up into our conversation is the original um, conversation that we had in our first summer uh, work week experience uh, with Nancy. And we talked about, so here's, here's the celebrated success of the aggregate. What are the faces to the data? What happens when we look at the disaggregated subgroups? So the first of the subgroups that we call attention to uh, is for ELA, and each, as we go through each subgroup, we're going to use that same pattern of ELA than math. The numbers still represent the combined percentage of uh, proficient and advanced. The red line now shifts from being um, the Falmouth High School trend line, that's the aggregate trend line, and the blue is the subgroups trend line over that same 10-year period. So you can see that for English language arts, uh, the difference of 56 points in the beginning of this 10-year study, and now we're closing in on um, 11 percentage points and still steadily working to close that gap. The story is a little bit different um, in math, and that is something um, that we have been very conscious of talking about in our action plan. Um, I had an opportunity today to sit in for about a half hour on the professional development session at Falmouth High School with the math teachers and the special educators who are both providing the inclusion support as well as the direct instruction in our essentials courses to listen to um, them collaboratively score common assessments and talk about where students are uh, this early in the year and start to put the paces towards the action plan for the next quarter. Economically disadvantaged students, again, this is for English language arts. There's a three, three uh, point gap um, persisting that we're working to close. Looking at, again, for mathematics, there is the trend line where the math line does come back down. And we've talked about a variety of uh, factors that have influenced that that we'll get to in our summary here at the end. And um, our special education or <coughs> disabilities are economically disadvantaged as well as our L's are all combined to create the um, subgroup of high needs. We have not separated out the L's. They are not a large enough um, number of students to have them as a publicly reported subgroup. But this is that composite piece of high needs. So when you take all of those subgroups together, you can see um, that closing of the gap here, ELA. 
And again, um, you can see the, the consistent, excuse me, the consistent trend for mathematics. So how does the data impact accountability? Um, we, Falmouth High School is this year now a level two school. We are literally one point away from level one. So you can imagine how frustrating that was. And we've had many conversations um, among ourselves and with the Department of Education actually about um, why is that, what happened, what happened with this cohort of students and how are we going to respond to that. And I think that in understanding sort of where we come from in that one point goes back to digging into the subgroups and recognizing um, where those trends are. And so um, there was two parts in making a comparison in this work. Um, one was to utilize the, the DART, the district comparison tool that DESI provides us annually. And uh, we looked at that and we are the top performer in that group of 10, that cohort of 10 schools. And then we also took a step back and did a Cape-wide comparison. Um, and we are still uh, among the top performers on the Cape. However, um, it's hard to provide you that information because as much as we can combine the uh, proficient and advanced ratings, there are about half of the schools that have eighth grade in their high schools. And because they have eighth grade and there's the two different tests, they didn't report the level. Uh, but that is something that we are also tracking. So um, Zach and I are going to be talking more about grades three through eight and nine. I promise Chris we'll talk about biology um, at a future meeting. But recognizing the change in that test, it's also coming up and it's intersecting with an adjustment in the accountability formula. And so we're sort of at this, um, this time where Massachusetts is really pivoting and they're trying to um, make excellent schools even better. And this is you know, the pressure. And we recognize that internally. And so we're careful in the comparisons we make externally because right now, as we presented the trend lines, we're trying to figure out how our subgroups compare to the aggregate and what we can do to close those gaps within our own <coughs> system. Because when we look at the, the aggregate numbers, we do see there are successes to celebrate and we want to put all students um, together in that celebration. And one comment I'd like to make as we've been looking at this data is, um, each one of us has felt, has expressed that we feel personally responsible for, um, you know, the, the achievement gaps that we're seeing persist. And I think that just speaks to our passion because we all take this so seriously. And um, I think each, all of us have said at that meeting, I feel personally responsible for this. You know, we really have, it's just our dedication and our devotion though that, that we are going to address this with all sincerity and really, try to do our best to, to make it better. So as, as Mary shared, um, just a quick look at the past few years. This is the, the accountability. So you can see level one under the prior formula uh, for 2012, which was the first time it was presented this way. 79% um, of our students met the target of 75 for all students, 76 for high needs. And it's those two. Um, you can't really tell here, but it's these two lines that we're trying to follow. So this is all students in high needs, and these are shaded in gray. Those are the targets that we're trying to follow. That's part of that accountability formula. So when we looked at last year, so the spring of 2016, we had made considerable <coughs> gains. 86% for all students, 98% for the high needs. And then under the new formula, um, you can see that at level two designation, uh, it's that second line. Uh, we met the target for all high needs, and the first of those shaded lines comes at 74, with 75 being the target. So that's that one point that Mary alluded to, and so we really tried to dig in deep to find out who are the students represented by that one point, and that's where our, our action plan comes from. Because it's <coughs> student. Correct. It's not. It's it's not one student. So when you when you talk about one point, I think sometimes it's misleading because when you put the names to the students, mm -hmm. it's it's a significant number of students. Yes. Is this per capita? Am I asking that correct? I mean, for example, do we have more ELL students than a school down the road? For example, and does that? How do you account for that? So, not you, but how does whoever? Yeah, so 
Mary reached out to the Department of Ed and asked them um, to walk us through the formula a little bit. And they do a lot of um, the, the performance index and the composite performance index. And they have a number of calculations that they run it through. But a lot of it is about narrowing the gaps and, and having more students earning proficient in advance than it is about um, <coughs> Who the student is in Yeah, what the student, who the students really are. Yeah, that's sad. Okay. Was the participation rate an issue? No, no, it wasn't. No. Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting with with the attendance piece. Right. Um, okay. Oh, so, Mr. McManaman <laughs> goes all out to get those kids in to take MDF. Well, because that could. Right. That. Right. Um, if you don't have a certain percentage of yes. participation, then you are automatically level two. Level two. two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. That was one of the first things that we. We looked at. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so catalyst for continuing to adjust our practice. If we go back to the responsive cycle that we opened with at the beginning of this presentation, um, we have been working our way through multiple revisions to the curriculum standards that had been the same for nearly two decades. Um, math and English have both been impacted uh, twice. Twice in the past four years. Five years. Once, for Once for English, twice for math. Uh, which has caused a sequencing of courses. Um, an interruption in the longitudinal data, just as we were getting good at tracking the MCAS, um, some of the information around PARC and where that may or may not have uh, allowed us to continue to follow certain trend lines. Um, reduction in available analytic tools, uh, they didn't build as robust of a reporting uh, system for PARC and a lot of that um, is where I've been able to, uh, alongside Zach, refine my Excel skills to the point you raised earlier. <laughs> Um, we're accelerating a transition to computer-based instruction and assessment, and that's that's not a slight. It's it's a response to where we are. Um, we talk about students' college placement is done through AccuPlacer. There's a level of readiness that we need to provide our students to ensure that they can access college instruction, um, and then the revised accountability metric. So these are some variables that we um, discussed in our MCAS working group about what what some what were what was different last year in terms of um, MCAS and how we approached it. And one was that we was the first year we did not have state funds to provide MCAS tutoring. And um, Sonia knows the history of that. And we had always at the high school identified students um, in need of MCAS support and actually had the funds provided by the state to hire two tutors, I believe it was, who came in and worked with students. Um, and so we lost that. We also have had changes in the math curriculum um, over time that have just changed our sequence of courses. So we're looking at that given that our math scores were not as high as we wanted them to be. And as we all know, student profiles are changing, um, which affect the availability of the student to learn. We also had a cohort this year who, um, there was a variance in test format. So when they were in eighth grade, they took the park tests on the computer. And um, so it's a, a, they're back to the standardized, you know, MCAS paper and pencil test. So in trying to understand the facts that are influencing our practice and, and then pairing that um, with the data, here's uh, in part a summary of our action plan for response. So we are working to strengthen our partnership among content educators, special educators, and bringing the department heads and the CEBAs together through the Curriculum Council. Um, we're continuing to collaborate our shared curriculum and instructional designs. Um, has been called out over um, the presentations for school improvement plans. We're looking both horizontally across the grades and vertically. Um, leverage common assessment results to inform revisions to units um, and to target instruction. And again, I had the opportunity to observe that um, in action today. Um, use and, and modeling of best practices, uh, differentiation, inclusion, um, and really where, where do those two uh, coincide in terms of our instructional philosophy. Utilizing structures within the school day, for example, Mary's talked about clipper time, um, the workshop courses that um, have a history at Falmouth High School to provide skill development, practice, and reinforcement, uh, perhaps missing there as an extension. And then investigate uh, funding opportunities, whether it's reinstating the exact program design we had or looking for a complement to that given the shift in, in the frameworks and the testing structure, providing um, support for students. And also, um, certainly as we talked about in this forum, partnering with McLean, 
Um, there's some work that we're doing around partnering with Leslie University as well, both to support the IST process as well as to uh, provide some trauma sensitivity professional development. Um, and then Gosnell counselors, and as Mary talked about earlier in her goals, the bridge program. Um, so certainly each one of these has a number of sub-details, but this is the overarching summary of where we are in our response to um, the data and the pressures that are on us and the shift in the frameworks and understanding our students. Thank you. Questions? Emma. Leah, you know <laughs> Sorry. Um, thinking about Title IV, is this a possibility that we could use <coughs> Title IV for um, MCAS? Support. The amount of money allowed in Title IV compared to the amount of money that we received under the former academic support grant is uh, very different, and the parameters for Title IV don't match up to the former academic support grant. Oh, they don't? Okay. You got another one? No. That's it? That was it. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I, you were talking about um, some of the um, things that you're noticing in particular with math when you're disaggregating the data. And um, I, I see an inflection point pretty regularly in 2014. Is that one of the times where there was some type of change in the curriculum because it it does line up on um, all the groups yes. um, in those, those time frames? So. And, and trying to track back to the reason why that um, happened. Carrie's done some research into that, and that's one of the things we're looking at our action plan, is what we were doing at that time before the last adjustment in the standards, is that something that we can return to that model? Because I, I guess you don't want to um, always be reactive to variables that are outside of your control. Mm -hmm. So yeah, looking at what kind of practices we want to keep in place regardless of how the curriculum changes or how the, the numbers are being produced, you know, coming from the state, but finding out what we're doing right and keeping that moving despite what might be happening externally. Yeah, and I think my comment is very similar to that um, because when you look at, when you look at the, the differences between the aggregate and the subgroups in English language arts, you can see it getting the, the gap getting smaller or at least remaining very small. Um, but then when you see math not doing that at all, of course, you know, that's flags for everyone. I don't need to tell you that. I'm sure you're more worried about it than I am. But, but what is it that is causing such success in that narrow gap in language arts that could be learned from, I guess, is you know, similar to, to Andrea's comment about controlling the things we can control. Um, and then my other, my other question was, of course, I flipped right past it. So a lot of the, conver or, um, con not conversation, but variables were about MCAS testing and changes in the test. And I guess, so, so my question, I don't even know how to say this accurately, but I worry about teaching to the test mm -hmm. <laughs> just to get that number when it's the teaching that is the piece that matters. So although, yes, it might help, I'd rather that we focus on having the kids actually learn. I think, though, when we look at the, the actual MCAS questions and where the deficits were, we look more at the concepts. And so maybe we need some to build better instruction for those particular concepts. Oh, okay. um, I know years ago, I know another school principal who said, um, every year they had a Shakespearean sonnet on the MCAS, so we started focusing on Shakespearean sonnets, and then that year they didn't have a Shakespearean right. sonnet. And so you're right, you don't, don't want to do that. Right, yeah. you want to look at the overall, the general concepts. Right, okay, that and makes I would me feel say, better. Philosophically, that's one of the things that Zach and I often say is that high quality instruction will yield high quality results. However, that we also have a responsibility to introduce students to, to the orientation of that test. Sure. And so sometimes taking common assessments that may have a similar structure or design is, is not meant to, to sort of coach them towards the test, but, but to provide that feels confidence yeah. in approaching it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I wanted to, one more comment. Um, so just in, in looking at this again, um, I would say that we are having a, cons a consistent growth in math. 
it's just our one subgroup here, the, the special education subgroup, where we've had a consistent decrease. And, and so that's the one that is concerning to me. As I look at these others, you know, it, it still is, maybe it's not as drastic a line as the ELA is, um, but you do see the trend going upward. So this would be, I, you guys know this. I know. That's, but that's like the, what we to look Yes. Like. So I know that like you might see these dips from last year, um, but you know, those could have many variables and just, yeah. So, sure. so I, I guess my only comment is, um, and we, had, we did start talking about supporting subgroups um, a couple of years ago, and so in moving forward, I really want to see a targeted plan that addresses special education students and what we're doing in terms of the curriculum to support them to make growth. They are our most struggling students and we need to really have a concrete plan. And I don't even think that it just starts at Falmouth High School. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back to what are we building? What skills are kids moving forward with? Um, and I'd really like to see an alignment plan that really brings special education into the fold. John. So coming at, at what point we do have to also incorporate the differentiation aspect of it too as well. Mm -hmm. Where kids are achieving what they're able to achieve mm -hmm. and we can't just put a line and mm -hmm. a number on them on a graph Agreed. too. And, and what I'm looking for is, is growth for yeah. individuals. No, absolutely. Yeah. Individual individual measured individual. Yep. Any public comment on our MCAS presentation? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next on our agenda is the discussion of district fees. So as we had planned at our last school committee meeting last night at our budget workshop, we discussed the fees and the, um, all the fees in the district and the budget implications of making any changes. Um, and then Patrick had included some information um, specific to this in his report. Sorry, if we jump out of order? Yeah. Okay. Patrick, would you like to, you know, give a summary or... Sure, the, the, the couple of paragraphs that I put in your report were just uh, suggesting uh, the background on the fee is, is seems to be uh, probably close to 20 years old. We can document uh, in a report that uh, Sharon identified at least 10 years ago that the fee was, the parking fee was uh, $80. Uh, and anecdotally, people said it's, it's been around for, for a lot longer than that. Um, the, the fee do, is used to um, to supplement, not supplement, to uh, help pay for a staff member uh, at the high school, um, and the um, and uh, the principal Gans can speak in detail about this, but if, if needed, but um, uh, it is reduced on a on a quarterly basis, uh, so that if a child is is buying this pass in let's say January or so it's it's half the cost of what it would be at the beginning of the year and if uh, if any students are uh, have a uh, true hardship all they have to do is reach out to mrs. Gans and, and that process uh, addresses uh, uh, addresses the fee for them um, so uh, this is something that's been going on for a long time. Um, the only other comment that I would make is, is it's uh, from a financial perspective, it's always difficult to make changes in the middle of a fiscal year. Uh, it is absolutely appropriate for school committees to take a look at uh, fees. I would just uh, encourage you to sort of coordinate uh, any decisions it's different than discussion, mm -hmm. decisions uh, sort of in that uh, February or March time frame if something is going to change so that we can then make the uh, uh, adjustments for the following fiscal year. Thank you. Um, and then out of yesterday, we had a couple more questions because um, we had already seen the information from Patrick because it was in the packet. So some of the other questions were about who's enforcing it. Um, whether or not anyone even checks to see if everyone has a sticker. And it is monitored um, in the afternoon and in the mornings by Larry Werner. And it, he looks to make sure that everybody has got a sticker. And then if there's a car that is, doesn't have a sticker, that student is, is followed up with. And um, let's see, that uh, Ms. Gans manages it if people can't afford to pay. The checks go to student activities. 
and what is the money used for? So Patrick spoke to that, and then the only other expense was that it does pay for the stickers, which would make sense. Because <laughs> so otherwise that would be ridiculous. A clarifying question, for, does it pay for the position that's monitoring the cars? Yeah, partially. Correct. Not, not entirely, because yeah. not enough money, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Co correct. I think 20 years ago it absolutely did. <laughs> okay. We, haven't ra we have not raised the fee. Okay. And he has other responsibilities. Yeah. He doesn't correct. just do the parking lot, but that is part right. of his position. Right. So with the fee not going up over time, it doesn't cover it anymore. Mm -hmm. And do we know why this fee came in place years ago? Was there any record of why? Yes, I talked, <laughs> okay. I talked awesome. to her. <laughs> I talked to um, the, the parking lot Nazi. She was, um, you know, in, in <laughs> good, <referred>. affectionately <laughs> referred to, because um, students have a parking lot, teachers have a parking lot, and um, they, it was, and also students could um, would leave during the middle of the day, so they it monitored that the kids were in their parking lot, that they were on the teachers' parking lot. Um, that only only people who had business at Falmouth High School were there because the stickers alerted them, and the people who walk around would um, take down the license plate and figure out who was parking there without a sticker. It also, if you're late for school, it was a way to get kids to not be late for school because you could lose your privilege. So it was for safety reasons. A lot of it was safety reasons. And when my son was in Falmouth High School, his car was broken into. So, I mean, I can say I would was glad that someone could walk around whenever they could. Mm -hmm. So, and then, uh, um, as Patrick had mentioned yesterday, that a lot of times it was done in part to discourage kids from driving because it's not a safe way to get to yeah. school. Buses are safer, for sure. So, John. Yeah. Um, with regards to the, uh, what's our annual budget now? Like 50 million or something, right? Mm -hmm. So the math on this, so if you look at the higher end one, is $18,000. Mm -hmm. That is 0. 0.00036 of our budget. My thoughts are we could just incorporate it into the budget somehow, rather than hitting the kids for the for the fee. I would still have to learn more since I'm just learning about it now, and I would be totally amenable to waiting until you know this the ship has already sailed for this year to waiting until February to get more of a handle on it and to see the real compelling reasons why we couldn't do point zero 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 three six, you know, to, to have it in there somewhere. Um, as far as, I'd like to think also that you could factor in the security-wise. I love having the stickers, by the way. I have a facility that constantly, we're on the beach and we need to know who's parking where, and we use a similar system. Um, so that part is great, just whatever the cost of it is and how we're implementing the stickers. And then whether or not uh, at the time when it was a safety focus, there's always a, a big safety focus. We now have uh, police substations in, in, in buildings now. So I mean, with that said, I see the gentleman that's you know monitoring the things uh, when in the times that I go in in the high school in the morning, uh, and he's usually standing right next to a police officer. Uh, in fact, he's always standing right next to the police officer and the and the police vehicle that's stationed there. So I just wonder whether we factor in whether that's redundant efforts too. But I really appreciate uh, getting this information together and also the broader picture of the overall fee structure too. So thanks. But I would I would look to like revisit again down the line too. Down the line. Thanks. Any last thoughts on that? I, I guess oh, sorry. Just, yeah. I would just put in there um, upon revisiting that to look at that as um, also part of the larger transportation because we do provide transportation for every student through our busing, which is a big chunk mm -hmm. of the budget. And so I don't want to lose that fact in the discussion either. Right. Fair enough. Any public comment on district fees? All right. Great. Moving on. Nancy, you're up next. All right. Presentation of 2017-18 goals. So everyone has a copy of my goals that have been um, vetted through the evaluation subcommittee. Um, and I just want to point out a couple of goals and, and answer any questions about my goals. Um, if you look at goal number one, the student learning goal, um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that our community is in crisis right now. 
whether it's with regards to the opioid epidemic or the increase or uptick in mental health issues that we're seeing in the schools. Um, and so part of my job here is to respond to those crises. And so you can see that in order to, to help students uh, be available for learning, I need to take that on. So I do my professional practice goal. Um, I am in my third year as a doctoral student at BC. Um, have not earned the privilege to use the title just yet, but <laughs> we're getting there. Um, and that's a goal that's not new to you. My district improvement goal, um, I'm really concerned about, the, um, about increasing my understanding of the impact of the legalization of marijuana on schools. Um, and if you remember when Massachusetts was considering that and we had um, a group of politicians go out to Colorado and start looking into what does that look like out there. Um, Part of their vision was to look at schools. That would be my only, my only focus. And so I did reach out to um, Senator DiMacito, who then hooked me up with Dr. Harry Bull, um, the superintendent at Cher the Cherry Creek School District. And so I've had conversations with him. And I will be going out to Colorado to talk to him about what does it look like in schools? What is it, how, how does Colorado manage it? What does the, is there money that comes into the schools? There are all kinds of sort of political issues around that. Um, and I will probably be doing that with a couple of principals. Um, I think we need to take a really good look at th that. And the police just had an issue. Um, if you, you saw it in the newspaper, you saw that what they, um, when they did an arrest and they got lots of drugs, I don't know if you noticed, there were like Cheerios and, and gummy bears. And so one of my real concerns is the edibles and, and how do schools manage that in this crisis. So that's a district improvement goal. Um, I have a second improvement goal and that's that focuses around the budget. And for my first two years it was really um, sort of increasing my knowledge around understanding the budget and now I need to expand that goal to really help uh, principals understand the budget process and one really big piece for me is that interconnectedness among students availability to learn instructional practices and how those pieces impact how you plan a budget because your budget speaks directly to responding to students needs so how do you plan the budget around that um, another school improvement goal is to um, continue to work on maintaining support to my individual principals as well as the collaborative relationships with town departments. Um, and that, the second piece of that is still really important to me. I think we, um, we've come a long way with our town departments um, and I need to continue to foster that. I think I, I um, do maintain support to the individual principals but I'd like to get out and have more conversations with them and more uh, building visits. And then my last goal, uh, Sonia and I are collaborating on this one because we want to start publishing the wheelhouse out of my office and uh, just as a way to increase communication with the community. Um, and that's actually been kind of fun. It's been kind of a fun project. It's a little bit different from what I'm used to doing. So I certainly will answer any questions around my goals. I think they reflect um, my values for the district and certainly my vision for the district. Do you want to speak to the process, like how this has been through? This isn't the first time we've seen these. No, so um, actually, if, if there's any oh, okay. comments about saying? the goals, and then I'll go through the, the process. process. Okay. Yeah. Well, Andrew. Um, so I had a question, um, two questions actually. One is, um, the research that you're going to be doing about um, marijuana and legalization of that and how that might affect school districts. Is there a tie in to a piece that's happening statewide? I wouldn't think that this would be unique to Falmouth schools and is there a way to tie into what other schools are researching on the same issue? I think they're, they're at the same place that I am okay. right now in my conversations. Um, but yes, I could do that. I think um, my focus really is, is Falmouth and I've had this conversation with some of the politicians and making it bigger, mm -hmm. but right now I want to focus on Falmouth. Okay, great. Um, and I guess the second one was in relation to um, 
communication around the budget. Mm -hmm. And so you've gone from you know, increasing your knowledge to working to principles. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering where the greater community fits into that um, in terms of making people um, more aware of um, how the, the budget is allocated. So basically I'm trying to think about laying the groundwork when we get to the point where we want town meeting to be supportive of that to not have as many hurdles um, when we get there. Is there anything that we can do along that way? Um, I think attending the precinct meetings, mm -hmm. and, and you have information with which to do that. Our budget booklets go out to different town departments, and they're put out publicly. Um, I think a lot of information gets out through the budget subcommittee. Um, and I certainly have had people come in and meet with me individually about the budget. Um, I think perhaps we could do more around publicizing the budget. Um, I think that you have to be really careful about timing around that. Do you think you'll do the traveling road shows again where you I went do it, to? Yeah. Okay. Patrick and I do it every year with the school councils. Right. Yes. So I think, I think this, that that's one of the so pieces. I think it, to get the message into yep. the school. It also <laughs> aligns with your district improvement goal three, which is about the town. Um, yes. And uh, build, c continuing your relationships and building strong relationships with town departments. And we do that pretty regularly with the finance committee and with um, the town manager's office. We are very, very supportive. Our chief financial officer, Jen Petit, mm -hmm. very supportive. So I, I have those connections. I, I'm just wondering if you're just talking about general. I think I'm um, thinking more about just what you've been describing and each of those people then becoming ambassadors mm -hmm. so it makes it easier and builds that goodwill um, as opposed to um, what often will happen where people want to come and be more critical of it when they have a better understanding of, of what's happening mm -hmm. and where those resources are going um, so yeah and I think the budget workshop is a big piece <coughs> of that because it helps all of us Absolutely. to understand all of that and to be you know, to be aware of all the moving pieces so that we can also do that and we can be the ambassadors as well because we're the, you know, strongest advocates for sure. John. And it shifts. Sorry. The budget, you know, is going through, it'll go through several iterations before we actually get there. Yeah. And, and so when I said something about timing, that's kind of what I mean mm -hmm. um, because I put it out to you and it, it stays my budget up until a certain time and then it becomes yours. I think it speaks well that you have a, a pulse of the community, uh, though, Nancy, of, of talking about Falmouth first, mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of transposing something from another area and then trying to make it fit into a round hole. Um, with us, I, I think, and having the ownership with working with folks locally, then, then they have the ownership of what you come up with. So I think I'm very uh, supportive of that, so cool. Thank you. Very good. Awesome. I'd like to speak to your student learning goal. Um, the specifically students impacted by the opioid crisis and the pre-K to four, um, any increased support that we can do as a district to help the whole family, I couldn't support more. Um, it doesn't just affect um, the students, it really affects the family and that impacts our community. So I, I appreciate you putting this as your first goal and really um, putting some highlight on this because it's really, um, it's, it's a big deal and I uh, really appreciate you having that as part of one of your highlighted goals. Thank you. You ready? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pass this down um, and pass this over. <coughs> so I'm going to walk us through these evaluation forms and um, about our evaluation and about the evaluation subcommittee. So, so just to um, go back to um, what Kelly had asked about before. So with, with Nancy's goals, the process is, is that she, um, she drafts the goals. The goals come to the evaluation subcommittee. Um, we have a first read with Nancy. Um, and then based on feedback and based on discussion, Nancy then revises the goals and then um, sent us her second draft, which is, will probably be her final goals. Um, so that's, that's the process for the goals. So there's, there's kind of like one step before it comes to us as a school committee. 
Um, Can you just let us know yeah. who's on that evaluation? Uh, yeah. It's the two of us and Walter. Okay. Yeah, so there's three of us and Nancy. Got you there. Um, so the purpose, I'm just going to go over the evaluation subcommittee so everybody gets a sense of what that group does. Um, the purpose is to support Nancy Taylor in her development and achievement <coughs> of her goals. And um, the goal of that subcommittee is for the school committee to be active participants in the evaluation of the superintendent by observing, collaborating around feedback, and developing evidence. And then um, we establish benchmarks for this subcommittee, um, which are really benchmarks for all of us here as school committee members. So that we will do six observations throughout the year focused on the superintendent's goals as presented to the committee on October 24th, what we saw today. We want to have three observations completed prior to the mid-cycle and three after, so three completed before our summative. Um, and the observations are aligned with the variety of goals that Nancy has um, and also to the evaluation um, standard indicators, elements, all of those components. Um, and that we all do summative evaluations. So that is a requirement. Each of us does a summative evaluation at the end, and then um, we do calibrate that into one evaluation, but um, Nancy does get every single evaluation from us. So um, that's, and the next piece is the timeline of how this works. So on October 3rd, we had our first meeting, um, the evaluation subcommittee, and so that's when we reviewed the goals, and we also agreed on our purpose. Um, and then today, we had the sharing of the goals, and I'm reviewing the timeline with you, um, and I'm also going to tell you a little bit about the observation piece. Um, so as you can see in those bullets there, that last piece is the observation possibilities. So last night, we had the opportunity to observe Nancy in action with the budget workshop, and I think maybe an observation did happen, possibly. I did it. I jotted down some notes. Too. Yeah. So we're, we're, getting, no we're getting there, we're getting there. <laughs> now you're on the spot, you're gonna have um, to finish it. <laughs> but um, Nancy also put two other opportunities for observations. Um, the mass mask hyenas <coughs> presentation, that's gonna be about what is that, that Nancy? Thing. That's about um, how the district is responding to the mental health needs and the opioid crisis here and why we are, um, apart from other districts because of all of our innovative programs. So that would be a great thing to see Nancy in action. And um, if you're interested in doing that, it would just be great to let Nancy know that you'll be there observing that. Um, well, maybe the person who's, who's already gonna, going. Who's already going. <laughs> yeah. Could do that. Is Are you volunteering? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> She's going to be there. Yeah. You're going to be there. Oh, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> that would be great. Okay. Great. Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a public forum on October 30th about the YMCA um, that Nancy yes. will be facil facilitating. And let me just clean up um, okay. what that's about. We promised um, the community that we would come back together and take a look at summer programs through the YMCA mm -hmm. and listen to the needs. So my part of facilitating that will be to hear, to listen, and to get ideas about what the community needs and how we can help build the summer program to meet those needs. Yeah. So that's a great opportunity to see um, your goal of working with community partners and stakeholders. So that's good. Um, so if you are interested in doing that observation, just uh, let Nancy know and um, so she knows that be there. Yeah. So with the observations, is there a way that we, is everybody supposed to do one? Is everybody supposed to do three? How are we supposed to let you know? How, how yeah, you so it would be great. So as you're doing that, I'm going to go over the forms and um, that might kind of clarify some of these pieces. But yes, if you are interested in doing an observation, if you could let me me know that would be great so I'll know that or actually after the observation happens that I know that an observation has taken place we can have more than we can have nine if everyone wants to do one that would be awesome but, but not right more than now, that yeah right now we're our goal is six so because it's time consuming 
for us and it's very time consuming for Nancy. Um, because it's not just sitting and watching, but also she has to have the opportunity to discuss it with you afterward. And if we all do four, you know, then she's spending more time dealing with us than she is That's doing what you're her job. Is a requirement and how it fit in, how we divvy that up. Yeah. It has pretty much worked. Yeah. Yeah. So we we were able to get six last year. Um, the year prior to that, we did say that everybody would do one. And that was challenging. It was too much. So um, that so our goal is six. And um, yeah, if you if you could let me know if you're gonna do an observation, and then when you're completed an observation, that would be great. Especially um, to know which ones they're in, because we don't want everybody to observe the same stuff. Yeah. Right. So these are three examples of different pieces that you could see Nancy in action. Um, then December twelfth. We have our review of the formative, so there is that, that's the mid-cycle, um, and that will be the evaluation subcommittee meeting, and then there will be um, a presentation of the mid-cycle, um, which is January 9th, and really that is, that's more of a, a just a presentation out of how you're doing Progress. about your yes, goals, kind of. towards mm -hmm. your goals. Um, and then on March 24th, there's a presentation on completing the superintendent's evaluation, so you'll get some more support on how to do that. Um, and then there's the deadline of March 28th is the last day to submit an individual observation um, to me. So you actually email me those. And um, then, so yes, okay, so those are the observations. And then the deadline for that summative evaluation is April 8th, and you can see it's highlighted. That's a very, very important date. I would put that in your calendar so you know that that is when the summative evaluations are due. And that's really a strict deadline because the turnover is fast and it takes time to calibrate all of our ratings and put it into one document. Um, so then on April 10th, the evaluation subcommittee will we'll meet to talk about um, the calibration process. And then on April 24th, the evaluation subcommittee will do a presentation of the um, summative evaluation to the superintendent. Oh, no, this is just with me and you, Nancy, right. for the right. presentation of the summative evaluation after it's been calibrated. And then there will be the presentation of the evaluation, on the summative evaluation on May 8th. And then we're really looking forward to starting off the next process early, early and really looking at the goals that you did this year and thinking about how they go to next year and so we can have those conversations. So the next um, piece of this is, um, it's a form that you can use. So I have this electronically, I'll, I'll email it to everybody. Um, it's basically you collecting the evidence of what you're observing, you put, you know, the date, you put um, what you're observing, what the me meeting is, um, and then what goal it aligns to. And then you put your evidence of where it is, all the details of that, and then you put any comments or observations, and then any recommendations you have for follow-up for, for Nancy. And then um, you, sub you s share that with Nancy, and Nancy then looks that over, she has, she puts her response to that, and you guys meet and talk about it. Right? Nope. So, that, so the whole idea is to have it be very dynamic and um, that you're actively engaged in observing the superintendent and the superintendent's actively engaged in responding to any questions um, that you have about the observation. And then after this is all complete, after Nancy has um, put in her feedback and you guys agree, then that is submitted to me. You can submit it to me. And there's an exemplar here. Walter, you remember when you did this? Yeah, Walter did that one. So we, um, we did, a couple of years ago, we made an exemplar for people to look at so you can get um, what, what a possible observation would look like. Can I tag on? Yeah. OK, so um, for people who haven't done this before, so at the end of the year, we fill out an incredibly long and complicated form evaluating how Nancy did on all of these goals and then some, and um, that's, that's our final evaluation. But these observations that we do periodically through the year, everyone will get them. So 
if Leah does one, we all get it. If Walter does one, we all get it. And the goal is to have them look at different pieces of the goals and have us get a glimpse of what our fellow committee members saw in action and be able to use that to more accurately evaluate Nancy and her goals. That's why we do it. Yeah. So that it's a better, it's a more full picture of what the year looked like through the eyes of our, of our committee members. Um, and so that's and I do find that, like last year, it was really helpful to see everyone's and read everyone's perspective. Um, yeah. So, so here. Um, I, from experience, I would say look at this page. Um, try to familiarize yourself with it over the next <coughs> few months because you, you try to address the, you know, try to answer these things. It makes your work less. It, it, it's a tool to help you focus it, mm -hmm. and it's overwhelming as hell. So, so I would say, so know, this the next sheet is try not to put that off to the end. Yes. So that's an observation sheet. So you can put like what this, the way I organize that sheet is that there, there's what the superintendent is saying or doing, and then there's what the audience is saying or doing. It gives you a good sense of what the reaction is to. Um, Nancy's presentation and what Nancy's presentation is in reaction to the audience. It's, an, it's just a nice way that I have found as I'm observing um, people professionally, it helps me. Now, this needs to be updated. So, Terry, I love that you use this resource, but I need to update this. I'm, it's just an example right now. This is Nancy's goals from last year. But so it gives it, you a feeling of, of what you're going to have to complete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even and if you don't do an observation, mm -hmm. you know. And after you do an observation, you can really check and say, you know, what goal did it apply to, and then what standard did it, did it apply to, also. And it's just, it's, it's a nice way to keep a record. So we know that, you know, if we're when we're getting towards the end of the year, and we're like, wow, we we really haven't seen um, some evidence of Nancy's student learning goal, for example. We could actually really say, so when can we, you know, can I come and visit you doing something around? Um, really supporting students who are in crisis with the opioid addiction. So can I just add to yeah. that? Um, and when you don't see something, remember that the binder is kept and every piece of evidence addresses a standard or a goal. Yeah. So that's a place where you may not have seen it in action, but you will see evidence of. So that is another resource for you school committee members. There's a big binder that um, you regularly update it with with it. it's evidence. Tons of stuff. Yes, with evidence. Well, it's fine. Sharon, yes, <laughs> regularly updates it with Nancy's evidence of what she's doing. So it's um, what I find really helpful too is is when you are so doing confused. your. I'm sorry. It is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> there's just there's we'll walk you through. We'll, we'll, we'll we'll, we'll, okay, because there's only two dates that are left on here. And so we're all going to be going to the same ones, which you didn't really want, right? There's only two le dates left. And then three. And then the we only spring. need three observations. We only need three observations mm -hmm. between now and January. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. So. Um, and then the other three will happen in the spring sometime. Okay. And we'll so have the other events to observe. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and we, did, we talked about that, no, no. that you might you'll put out some ideas. Mm -hmm. for yesterday. Yeah. So. And if um, <coughs> new school committee members want to come and meet with me individually just to go through this and, and I can show you what I do and I can go through my calendar to say you might want to look at this or that, I'd be more than happy to meet with you. Okay. And you. anything could be an observation too. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't have, have to, to be, be specifically on no, here. No, no okay. it doesn't. Mm -hmm. it no, can these be, are just examples. Possible. It's it's honestly, it can be anything that you find interesting or that piqued your interest or... Um, and, and it is very overwhelming. It's a lot. But it's also but probably the most important thing that we do. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I know. You no pressure. You mentioned the binder. Um, are we expected to go through that binder? Yeah, At so some point, you'll is there to. a particular time or is it multiple times? You can go and check it out um, anytime. Really, the, um, the mid cycle is a really good time to go look at. You know, because that's halfway through the year, and then um, toward in the spring is a good time too. I find that 
if I have, if I'm kind of like, hmm, I'm not sure about how Nancy's doing towards this standard, it's, that's helpful because then you can go in and kind of look for that information. And, um, but you could also just look at everything and get a sense of. Is it chronological or is it by goal? It's by goal and standard. And standard. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So that helps you. Which so you're like, ah, I yeah. this information. Here it is. Perfect. So yeah, it's so a lot, but it's, it'll be fine. We will work through it together. And um, Megan and Andrea, you guys could to can totally contact me if you want to walk through this in a okay. one on one manner. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any last questions for Leah about the timeline? <laughs> Great. All right, what do we have next? So oh, sorry, I will, go ahead. And I will email um, these documents so you have them electronically, and I will update the goals. Um, I just didn't, I didn't get a chance to, well, I wanted to make sure we agreed to the goals before putting them on here, so that was the piece. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, routine business. Uh, the minutes from October the 10th. Um, we have them in our packet. Any? <coughs> Uh, is there a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from October 10th, 2017. Is there a second thought? Great. Uh, any discussion, comments, questions, thoughts? Uh, Done. A discussion point. Uh, so page three on uh, page three of four, section three on the last line, it mentions the, uh, uh, the consider Columbus Day and it phrases it as if I had come up with that. The basis for my comments was the fact that uh, under our, our um, policy manual, file AA, uh, the, we have to comply with the laws and statutes of the state of Massachusetts. And the state of Massachusetts has a holiday called Columbus Day. So it is completely illegal for this board to even discuss changing that. So what is your... So are my you, motion is, change? I'm going to make a motion oh, to, add it? A, to amend the motion for line three, uh, the last line. So I motion we adjust... Number three, the last line in the minutes to read. Mr. Fernari requested minutes reflect not using the word issue as it unfairly frames any potential discussion. Mrs. Welch adjusted it to say, consider Columbus Day. I'm sorry, can you say that again, John? Okay, so my motion is that we adjust the minutes in line number three, the last line, to say that Mr. Frenario requested minutes reflect not using the word issue as it unfairly frames any potential discussion, period. Mrs. Welch adjusted it to say, consider Columbus Day. So I think you actually said that it shouldn't say the Columbus Day issue because that presumes there's an issue. Correct. That's actually what you and said. And the way it's phrased, it's, it says that I said consider Columbus Day. Oh, so you don't, that. you didn't suggest that. I don't want us to that. consider Columbus Day. It's a state holiday. I see what you're saying. And the tribe that we are in is the state of Massachusetts, is our oh. tribe. I see what you're saying. I got oh, you. Yeah. Okay, so and it you was said saying, consider I Columbus said that. Day right. instead of saying Columbus Day issue. That's what you were referring Correct. to. Correct. Right. I got okay. you now. Okay. So, um, so the, did, Sharon, did you get it? No. Okay. <laughs> so it would say, Mr. Renari requests the minutes to reflect that I'm happy to repeat. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Uh, motion that we adjust number three, the last line in the minutes to read. Mr. Frenari requested minutes reflect not using the word issue as it unfairly frames any potential discussion, period. Mrs. Welch adjusted it to say consider Columbus Day. Okay, got it. Um, I, we don't need a motion, it's just an edit. Okay. So it's not, it, we, don't need a, we don't need to do anything on that, unless there's any other discussion with that, but it, it seems accurate, so I think, I think we have to be careful, though, because we told those people earlier we weren't gonna talk about it, so. Well, we're just correcting the minutes, all so right. I think we're okay, but good, fair point, gotcha. Um, okay, so all in favor of the minutes with the correction as John read. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Abstaining. Uh, one abstention from Megan. All right, passes. Thank you so much. Next, report from superintendent. Um, okay, let me just take a look. 
um, I just, yeah, I think we have. I just want to call out that, um, and, and Mary and did talk about presenting at NEASC. I thought that was important. Please take a, a moment um, when you get a chance to take a look at the director's reports from VIPS for September and October. I think those are really important. Um, and the only other thing I'll call out is when I was asked to co-anchor the news um, at Falmouth High School and what a blast that was and kudos to, uh, kudos to Ryan Weber for the way he runs that program, that actual TV studio at Falmouth High School. It, you would have thought you were at a real TV studio. It was amazing, it was fun, um, and, and it was great to be in that building. You want to call up the Bulldog Bowl too? Because I heard it was a riot. Well, <laughs> I have a new career. I'm telling you right now. So I MC the Bulldog Bowl every year with um, Mr. Heller. And we just really have a good time. And it's fun and it's exciting. They had an incredible turnout. And um, I think I want to do radio. <laughs> <laughs> Your next see. career. That's my next Not career. Yet. We, we need a few more years, <laughs> for sure. Um, reports from assistant. So, We've already heard all of your on cast stuff. Would you, is there anything else you'd like to highlight on? No, thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Okay, I think we already covered that. Um, Zach. Um, I think Sonny mentioned earlier that we'll be presenting at a future meeting on the MCAS course for grades uh, K through 8 and 9th grade as well. So we'll be putting that together for you. Any other, any questions for Zach? Um, we don't have Charlie, so we will skip over that. Cindy. Oh, sorry. You Just it's really highlight? important yeah. to know where Charlie is. Oh, yeah. So yes. Holy yes. really Cross at yeah. that conference, mm -hmm. and, and I, I thought it was important to send him. So. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. I'm hoping we'll hear about He will bring it back to the district. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cindy, anything you'd like to highlight? Not tonight, but I'd be happy to take any questions. I have one question. Can we get the dates for the technology advisory report? You said that you've got the meetings mm -hmm. planned out. Are they in the district calendar? Um, I'm just curious. Good question. Yeah. I'm not sure if they sent them to Terry yet or not. Or, yeah, I would love to know when they are. Okay. Just so I don't know. I'm curious. That would be great. Any other questions for Cindy? Great. Thank you. Joanny, anything you'd like to highlight? Continuing to move forward in the <laughs> initiatives that, that uh, are underway with our teaching assistants and our building of substitute pools and adding more structures to the HR functions. Glad to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for John? You got the blinding bright paper. If we can't have any more staff, we're running out of colors. <laughs> Uh, Patrick, anything that you'd like to highlight other than we already talked about fees? Anything mm -hmm. else you want to? I hope to see a few a few of you uh, celebrate Terry's award at yeah. MAS CMASS conference. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Any other questions for Patrick? Oh my gosh, we're flying all of a sudden. Okay, uh, report from the chair. I only have a couple quick things. Um, one, we had at the last meeting tabled the discussion of the fitness room until tonight, but you saw it wasn't on the agenda, so it'll be on at some point when we get to the fitness room sign um, topic. Yes, we just will. need to have somebody here, so that's why you didn't see it um, tonight. The other thing is that um, going back to one of the questions, request for information about the boxes that are at all the uh, different schools about books and clothing, um, and the answer was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but that they are all individually run by the PTOs, so the PTO mm -hmm. of that school, so they're not, con there's no connection so amongst I, them. Could I make a comment to that? Sure. You're co-president of the East Falmouth PTO, and we, um, we you do don't. not. Yeah, no. Okay, so we better go back to that again. Okay, sorry. We're trying, or we can, or not we for can, lack of trying. We can take it offline. If, yeah, um, let's do that. That's a good idea. That's fine, too. Um, the, we had a follow-up item about the screening for not yet, and a number of us met yesterday and had the opportunity to screen that. So um, thank you to Megan for bringing it up as an issue and for everybody that could make it, and for Nancy for getting it for us. The only other thing I had is um, at our last meeting, we, we were meeting during the NBC news story. Yes. So since then, um, it, so for everyone that had a chance to see it here and not, 
Um, I just wanted to say thank you to you, to Dr. Dale, to the parents, teachers, everyone that was involved in it because I thought it was really, really well done. And I know that a lot went into making sure it accurately reflected the district and did it in a, in a positive light and it could have it could have not gone like that. So I'm very appreciative for all the extra work that went into it um, to shine light on what we're doing here. Um, because I thought it was really awesome. I don't have anything else. So, uh, committee member reports. Here. Um, the policy subcommittee met and um, one of the items we were tangling with was the absence policy and it's very complicated. And as you see when, you, when the principals come, every school has to work on it. And there's so many parts to it and I keep, you know, hoping that we can I mean, the parents have a part in it too that sometimes I feel is out of our control and yet we get, we are, I mean, we're not, we shouldn't ignore it don't, by any means, but I just don't know that the, that particular policy is, um, the responsibility is shared enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, but anyway, the, the, so that was one of it the things we took a policy up. meeting. And we have another meeting November, coming up. I'm looking at you. <laughs> We'll just say coming up. Coming up. Since we don't know off the top you. of our head. I can yeah. tell you. Okay. December. November 28th. November 28th. Uh, any other committee member reports? Any requests for agenda items or follow-up information? Uh, just, no. a, just a comment. I had the, uh, the chance to stop by T-Ticket uh, School on Saturday around noon and just to see Deb Pinsons and her group uh, hustling there, you know, three hours ahead of time, and it looked really cool. And then the uh, the PTO was really a cool setup, both inside and out. So, uh, just kudos to to that uh, wonderful organization. Over there. Awesome event. Any other agenda items or requests for follow up? All right. Uh, that's oh gosh, that's it, right? So our next meeting is not on a Tuesday. Um, so just make sure that you've got that in your notes, that it's Monday, November 6th, uh, over at Lawrence, because it's right ahead of town meeting. It's short, and um, hopefully everybody will still be able to make those precinct meetings. Very. On that note, I would like to make a motion to move into executive session to conduct contract negotiations with non-union personnel. The respective school committee will not return to public session. And that, oh, sorry. Give me a second. A second. Thank you. It's a roll call vote. Walter, will you start us off, please? Yes. 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 All right. We adjourn to executive session. <laughs>